dollar, dollar, dollar. Dirt and money, no soul. Had to go and get it, ain't no time to kick it. Got a stack of flip for my foes. Dollar, 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 dollar. Please tell me you can hear me. Don't turn your back and don't neglect me. Just let me know if you need me. Dollar, 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 dollar. Let me watch out for my partners. Keep my money long, get my team strong. Let me run away from my problems. Yup, let's get original crew. It's your boy DJ Nuki, your girl. Sierra Nicole. Back on the channel, man, with more Mr. Ball. We got the terrifying true story that inspired Candy Man. Remember, I was just telling you this the other day. Oh, for real. I don't remember. Wow. I was telling you the story about Chicago. It happened. And then that, and that the, man was going the, through the wall. The, the wall, the bathroom, the, the bathroom closet. So. Or did, did I say the, uh, was it the, the, the mirror? On the, on the, in the I, bathroom? Yeah, something like something that. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, you did. I remember. <laughs> so, with the being said, I, I, like, I always come across it, but I always forget the, like, the minute detail. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I don't, I can't give you the detail, but I'll give you a vague story. Yeah. Of what inspired Candy Man. Have you... You have you watched both? Can we watched one? Yeah, we we watched. watched the new one together. Did you watch the old one? Mm -hmm. The very old one. I can always watch it up to like the first half, and then I'll end up fall asleep or get bored you get of scared. it. No, it's just I'll just be like tired <laughs> of watching it, and I'm just like, I was just saying. I I know I watched the newest one, but yeah, yeah, I watched the new one for sure, for sure. But I can't the old remember one, if I watched the old one or not. I always get to the point where it's like the the white woman that comes and she. Visit that family and she found everybody killed or something. Found okay, I think I do. I think I have watched it. I always get to that part and I just be like, all right, whatever. Bro. I don't know. <laughs> and then she gets possessed and, and gets crazy. I always watch it up to that part. But with that being said, man, she always still, still trying to think, man. <laughs> Make sure you check out the links in the description box. Down below. You already know where to go, man. You want the first part, you got to do is check out down below. Also, if you enjoyed today's video, like it with a thumbs up. That's all we ask, man. So, with that being said, we want to go ahead today's and get story. Yeah, we're trying to get Damn. right into it, huh? Come I, on. I didn't click on it. I'm trying to get the screen recording you, you going. Clicked on it. No, I, I got the screen recording going. That's all. Okay, baby. All right. Mm -hmm. Today's story inspired a popular horror movie, and when you get to the reveal in this story, you'll understand why. It is literal nightmare fuel. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please sneak in to the like button's house and toast all of their bread and then leave. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. One day in early January of 1987, a very strange 52-year-old woman named Ruthie Mae McCoy walked out of her 11th floor apartment in Chicago, Illinois. Today was the day that Ruthie was going to be doing one of her self-appointed public duties. Ruthie was quite tall, and this particular day, she had on two pairs of pants with a dress over them. She also had her favorite long stick she was carrying. And as Ruthie marched down the hallway, she began jiggling each of her neighbor's doorknobs to see if they were unlocked. And then in between each doorknob check, she would suddenly stop and wave her stick around like it was a sword and she was fighting off some unseen attacker. And so after Ruthie had checked four doors in a row that were all locked, she reached the fifth door, and when she tried the doorknob, it was unlocked. And so without any hesitation, Ruthie pushed the door open, she stepped inside and began yelling, hey, look at me, I'm inside of your apartment. And the woman who lived in this fifth apartment was in her kitchen making dinner at the time, and when she looked up and saw Ruthie barging into her apartment, she wasn't scared. She was just totally annoyed. She rolled her eyes and then began yelling at Ruthie to get out now. But as always, Ruthie didn't listen. And before long, Ruthie had moved from the door frame into the apartment, into the kitchen where she was waving her stick around wildly and berating this young woman for leaving her front door unlocked in this very dangerous apartment building. 
The young woman yelled at Ruthie a few more times to try to get her to just leave, but Ruthie didn't budge, and so eventually this young woman picked up the phone and called 911. It would turn out the 15-story apartment building that Ruthie and this young woman and all of their neighbors lived in was indeed a very dangerous place to leave your front door unlocked. In fact, at the time, in the late 1980s, this particular apartment building was considered to be one of the most dangerous places in all of Chicago, with a murder occurring there nearly every week. Gangs basically ruled the building, which was totally falling apart and totally decrepit and had these long dark hallways that thieves and killers could hide in and so why they kind of look like a jail oh, dude. like you already getting ready for prison so when you go there it's like home like that you know what i'm saying yeah. like the bars on the thing like the hallway dark gloomy brick hallway that's so that look yeah. like a prison bro they don't look like i don't know man that's crazy bro Ruthie wasn't wrong in trying to get her neighbors to keep their doors locked, but her very hands-on approach to delivering this message was never met with appreciation from the people who lived on her floor. Instead, her neighbors viewed Ruthie as potentially more hazardous than anything Ruthie was trying to protect them from. However, in reality, Ruthie was not a threat to her neighbors. She was just totally mentally unstable and basically afraid of everything. For example, whenever Ruthie got mail, she would just assume that it was terrible news and most likely about someone coming to take all of her money. And when Ruthie was out in public, which was quite rare, she was so scared of strangers that whenever she passed them, she would just yell out obscenities at them to keep them away. And then also when Ruthie was in public, she never ate because she was afraid strangers were we're going to literally run up and take her food. So back inside of this fifth apartment that Ruthie has barged into, Ruthie was busy berating this young woman about her unlocked door when the police did finally show up and they dragged Ruthie out of the apartment into the hall. The police by this point knew Ruthie really, really well, and they were not about to arrest her. They knew she was harmless, but just kind of out of her mind. And so, like they always did in this situation, they told Ruthie to leave her neighbors alone and just go back into your apartment and mind your own business. And Ruthie usually would mutter something under her breath about needing to increase the security in this building, but she would eventually do as she was told and she would go back home. And that was basically Ruthie's life in a nutshell. Constant fear and paranoia from living in this totally dangerous apartment building, exacerbated tenfold by her very poor or mental health. But Ruthie was not content with her life. She, like virtually everybody else in this high-rise apartment building, wanted to get out and live somewhere else and have a better life. But Ruthie, like virtually everybody else living in this high-rise apartment building, did not have enough money. And so she was trapped there. But then in February of 1987, so one month after busting into that woman's apartment, Ruthie got incredible news. She had recently begun going to a day program for psychiatric care at a local hospital, and the staff there had really taken a liking to her, and they were going above and beyond trying to help Ruthie kind of get her life together beyond just her mental health. And so one of the things they were doing with her was helping her apply for various government programs like disability payments. And so that month in February, Ruthie found out that the application they had sent off for her was approved and so Ruthie was entitled to disability payments which meant right away she would get a check for two thousand dollars and then every month going forward indefinitely she would get a payment it wouldn't be two thousand dollars but it would be a lot of money Ruthie was beside herself she could not believe her luck and she now knew that with this money she would finally be able to move out of that terrible apartment even before the money began coming into Ruthie, she was already looking for a new place to live. And as she did this, all she could think about were her two beloved grandchildren, a little boy and a little girl. They were the only people in the world, it seemed, to Ruthie that really accepted her and just loved her unconditionally. And so whenever Ruthie would go visit her grandkids, the three of them would sit on the ground and just play together for hours and hours. But to that point, Ruthie 
Ruthie's grandkids had not been allowed to visit Ruthie at her apartment because it was too dangerous. But now that Ruthie was going to move in to someplace much, much safer, she knew that was going to change. She was going to see her grandkids so much more often. And this made Ruthie so happy. And this newfound happiness inside of Ruthie really motivated her to start looking at other aspects of her life and see if she could improve them. And so as Ruthie is doing this new apartment search, she began taking classes to finally get her high school degree. She began picking up these old art projects she had kind of blown off. And also, most importantly to this story, she really began leaning into her religion, something she had not been doing for a long time. Specifically, Hey, when I did my research on the candy man, I ain't never come across none of this information. <laughs> I came across something else. Like I don't Did you come across Ruthie at all? I know it was a female involved somewhere. Oh. But I heard it was a guy like behind. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I ain't it's a woman well, I ain't gonna get to yeah, but Yeah. <laughs> She began tuning in to these very animated preachers that she would find on TV. And when she really liked one of them, she would write them a letter. And in this letter, she would praise them for their sermons and how incredible they were. And she would ask them to bless her with miracles. And these miracles were often just centered on her health. She wanted to look and feel young again. And some of these TV preachers, who were actually just running scams, would write back to Ruthie and say, of course we can bless you with your miracles, but first, send us some money. And so, when Ruthie's disability payments began coming in, even though she needed to save every penny to be able to afford moving out to start this beautiful new life with her grandkids, she still found a way to set aside some of that money and sent it off to these TV preachers. And soon, these preachers were sending things back to Ruthie. Things like a blessed piece of wood for her to sleep on, or bottles of water said to be from the Holy River Jordan. These spiritual items were often accompanied with a letter from these preachers telling Ruthie that in order for them to fulfill her miracles request, she would need to keep these spiritual items close to her and also send us some more money. And so Ruthie did as she was told, and after sending off all this money, she would excitedly wait inside of her apartment for her miracles to come true. And while she waited, she began tacking up all these newspaper articles all over her apartment of these people who miracles had happened to them, that supposedly God had fixed their teeth or eradicated a tumor in their brain or cured them of cancer. And in all of these stories, the person who the miracle happened to would describe looking in the mirror one day and just looking different. And that was the moment they knew that this miracle had occurred. And so Ruthie, believing this was bound to happen to her any day because she was working with these TV preachers, began going to her bathroom mirror all the time and just looking at herself, looking for some visible change in her appearance that would indicate one of her miracles had come true. But by April 22nd, so roughly a month after finding out she was going to be receiving these payments, and this was about two weeks before she was set to actually move out into her new place, Ruthie had still not seen any sign in the mirror that she had changed, and so she believed these miracles had not happened yet. But something else had begun happening when Ruthie was in the bathroom looking at herself in the mirror. And that was, she would hear somewhere off in the distance the sound of someone talking to her. It was almost like they were whispering to her, but she couldn't quite tell what they were saying. Now, Ruthie wanted to believe that these disembodied voices had something to do with her miracles coming to fruition, but Ruthie was naturally a very paranoid and scared person, and so she couldn't help but be a little bit scared of these voices. And so that afternoon, when Ruthie was on the bus headed back home after a doctor's appointment, she told a friend on the bus about these strange whispers she was hearing, and Ruthie would also say that she felt like these whispers meant that somebody was out to get her. Now, Ruthie's friend knew Ruthie really well, and this just wasn't unusual behavior for Ruthie. Ruthie routinely thought people were out to get her, and she talked about hearing voices before in the past. And so this friend told Ruthie that, you know, you really should tell someone about this. 
But deep down, this friend was not that concerned. This was kind of normal Ruthie behavior, and this couldn't be a big deal. However, it would turn out to be a huge deal. That night, around 8.45 p.m., when Ruthie was back home at her apartment, she called 911. And when the dispatcher answered her call, Ruthie was in a total panic, and she was talking about something to do with the cabinets and with her bathroom and how her neighbors wanted to use her bathroom. And the dispatcher just did not understand. And they tried to ask Ruthie some clarifying questions, but Ruthie just could not put together a coherent sentence. And so the dispatcher told Ruthie that they would send police over right away. And then afterwards, the dispatcher would put out to the officers in the area that, hey, Ruthie McCoy seems to be having some sort of argument with her neighbors over cabinets. I don't really know, but someone needs to go check it out. And when the officers got that call, they were not quick to respond. They knew Ruthie. They knew that this was likely nonsense. But 15 minutes after Ruthie called 911, 911 got another call from somebody else inside of Ruthie's apartment building, and they were calling to report hearing loud noises coming from inside of Ruthie's apartment. And so at this, the police did act quickly. They rushed over to the apartment building, they went to the 11th floor, they went to Ruthie's door, and they began pounding on her door because it was locked. But Ruthie didn't come to the door, and it was totally silent inside of her apartment. And so at some point, the police called back to dispatch and asked them to call Ruthie on the phone she had just used 15 minutes earlier to call 911. And so these police officers are standing right outside of Ruthie's door, and they're listening to the sound of Ruthie's phone ringing inside of her house, but Ruthie didn't answer it. And again, the apartment stayed totally quiet. And so the responding officers turned around and began walking down the hall and knocking on other people's doors and began asking them, hey, did you hear any loud sounds coming out of Ruthie's apartment? And everybody said no. And so but you gotta realize though where you at. Yeah. Y'all police going and knocking on doors, bruh. The, at, especially at low income apartments, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's mind your business. Yeah. Shut your mouth, mind your business. Mm -hmm. Don't talk to the police. Because yeah. even if something happened, I I say, hey, y'all don't got to live here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, It's already one of the most dangerous places to live. Now you want me to talk to the police and tell them something and got right. even more, more issues going on with me? Now I just want to be here safe. I can't afford to live nowhere else. Mm -hmm. I got to afford to be able to be safe here. So, yeah, I'm going to tell you now. Nah. Like, but I wonder, do they have probable cause at this point to just break into that? Into the, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's just like what kick down the door. Kick down the door, but those, you know, the project doors are a little tough to kick down. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like you just ain't finna go up in them thing. Yeah. So I guess that's the reason why they couldn't. You know. I guess. What 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 would you have done if you was the police at that time? Well, first I gotta follow protocol one, but. But with the a neighbor calling and saying that they hear, you know, are hearing things, and dispatch is calling back, there's a silence, there's nothing happening. Not since I've seen you know she's not anywhere else but inside her apartment. Yeah, already familiar with it. And y'all are familiar with it. I'm just going to have to get permission to enter in or something. Call, cause I'm sure y'all got a landlord somewhere, somebody, uh, yeah, housing maintenance, somebody over housing authority. Something. To come come in and allow, allow y'all access into it. Say, hey, we got a report. There's a complete silence. She's known to be irate and very energetic. Or I had got a complaint that there were loud noises 15 minutes. Yeah, but now it's Whatever, quiet. But... It's, it's too quiet and y'all know who she is. Mm -hmm. Y'all know how she is. We yeah. need to breach the apartment just to check on her. Right. What is it called doing a... Uh, Welfare. Welfare check. But I wonder, did they do welfare check back? I don't know. So the police eventually just kind of gave up and left, despite not seeing Ruthie, not talking to Ruthie, not seeing what's going on inside of her apartment. The next day, when one of Ruthie's friends on her floor noticed that Ruthie had not come out of her apartment all day, and when she knocked on the door, Ruthie didn't answer, 
this friend called the police. The police came out again, they knocked on Ruthie's door, and after a while, when she didn't answer, the police again just left. Ruthie's friend, who had called the police, was furious that the police were not taking this seriously, and so she wound up contacting maintenance of the building, and a janitor went up to the 11th floor, went to Ruthie's door, drilled through the lock, and pushed her door open. The janitor immediately yelled out for Ruthie, but there was no response, and so he stepped inside and kind of looked around, and right away he was struck by two things. One, it was a total mess inside of her apartment. There were all these religious books and pamphlets all over the ground, but as messy as the apartment looked, it also seemed weirdly empty. Like, there was no TV, there was really no furniture or anywhere to sit. It was almost like this apartment had been half moved out, and then whoever was moving it out had just kind of stopped. The janitor started to get a really bad feeling about being inside of this apartment, but he mustered the courage to walk a little farther into the apartment to look into the bedroom. And when he turned the corner and looked into that bedroom, he froze. Because there, on the ground, was Ruthie McCoy. She was lying on the ground in a pool of her own blood. She was dead. The police were called, they came out, they walked around her apartment, and they concluded that this was kind of an open and shut case. Ruthie must have opened her door for the wrong person who came inside and killed her. Remember, this apartment building saw one murder nearly every week, so this really was kind of routine. And just a couple of days later, the police would arrest a 19-year-old living in this apartment building named Edward Turner because he was found to be in possession of Ruthie's TV. Edward did not admit to doing anything, but the police assumed that, you know, he must have tried to rob Ruthie, and in the course of this robbery, perhaps Ruthie had tried to fight back, at which point Edward had overpowered her and killed her. But the police did suspect that there was at least one other person involved in Ruthie's murder. Murder, so they did keep investigating. And then in June, so about a month and a half after Edward was arrested, the police began hearing this very disturbing rumor about the building where Ruthie had lived. At first, the police completely dismissed it because it sounded totally made up. But when it kept coming up over and over again, whenever they interviewed anybody in this building about Ruthie's murder, the police finally decided they had to at least look into it in order to confirm that it was not true. However, when the police looked into this rumor, they would discover that it was true, and it absolutely played a role in Ruthie's murder. That's what I was saying. Like I, I said it was a woman. I've heard about a woman. Mm -hmm. I didn't know her background story. Yeah. But I did hear about a woman being killed. I'm, this is way more detailed, yeah. you know what I'm saying, than any information I've found. Because everything I found is just very vague and more like yeah. the circumstances around everything. But I didn't know that, you know what I'm saying? Because I don't even remember if I ever came across the name, her name. Her name, yeah. But, um, damn, what was I going to say? Uh, I did hear about some people getting arrested for being in possession of her property. Mm -hmm. But basically, somebody stole her property after they after she was killed but how how did they steal her keys to to lock her door back or they just locked the door back after they left or let's turn back in okay. i know i know but let's oh, turn okay. back in <laughs> <laughs> that it was not true. However, when the police looked into this rumor, they would discover that it was true, and it absolutely played a role in Ruthie's murder. Back on the night of April 22nd, 1987, so the night that Ruthie called 911 in a panic, saying something about her cabinets and her neighbors and her bathroom, well, what had really happened is Ruth was home around 845 when she heard this loud banging sound coming from her bathroom. And then before she could go over, and inspect the bathroom, her bathroom door flung open and standing in the doorway was this dark, tall figure who just suddenly took off running through her apartment, out her front door, out into the hallway. Ruthie was so startled she had no idea what to make of it. She knew that sometimes she saw things that weren't real and so she likely struggled to figure out, did that really happen? Am I dreaming? Am I hallucinating? What's going on? And so with all these thoughts going through her head, she called 911 to get help, but she couldn't quite describe what had even happened. And so that's why she began rambling about how her neighbors wanted to use her bathroom and the cabinets were somehow involved. It was all very confusing. And so the 
the dispatcher obviously didn't understand what was going on, but they told Ruthie, okay, I'll pass this along and the police will be out soon. And so as Ruthie is waiting for the police to show up, she wanders over to the bathroom where this dark figure has appeared and she walks inside and she looks at where her mirror had been above her sink. The mirror that she had spent so many hours looking into, hoping for signs of a miracle and the mirror was gone. And in its place was this big dark hole on the wall, almost like an entrance to a dark tunnel. And as and that's what I'm saying, like, people were coming in. So, damn, I don't know what all detail, but that's how the person got into her apartment right. through this. You know what? You remember that time we came across something and it happened like that in New York? That behind, also, oh, what, what show we watched? And it was like that too. Was that on 911 or Ricky where yeah. she she felt breeze coming through and come to find out uh yeah, when rookie. she took down her mirror? Yeah, it was Ricky. Mm -hmm. When she took down her mirror, somebody was living in a back, in the back, back yeah. space mm -hmm. and they were actually gaining access into her house, eating her food, like and then yeah. and then when she cause she was like, I'm always feeling the drift. And I and Damn, so whoever did this had to know, like, figure out how the apartments were structured right. as well for you to even realize that I could cut a hole and gain, and access, gain to, access to the apartments. That's scary, though. Very much Cause so. You, also, you have to think about it. These are cinder blocks. Yeah. These ain't just no uh, side, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's shit crazy and scary, though. Ruthie is staring at this void. She sees these two dark hands emerge from underneath that come out of the hole and grip onto her sink. And then eyes pop up and a man's head pops up. And then he uses his arms, which are clutched onto the sink, to pull himself up and out of the hole in her wall where he plopped down on the bathroom floor and then stood up and- Hold on, hold on. So what was the first dude that came through. Right. So now we got, got two individuals. And he ran out in the hallway. Where did he go? he came through. He kicked open the door. The bathroom door ran through. And this another individual. Oh, hold on. Yeah, yeah. Go. I need more detail. <laughs> Out of the hole in her wall where he plopped down on the bathroom floor and then stood up and stared at Ruthie. And then everything after that point would have happened really fast. Ruthie likely began screaming, at which point the first man, the dark figure that had run out into the hallway and prompted Ruthie to call 911, he must have heard Ruthie screaming. And so he came running back in through the front door into Ruthie's apartment with a jacket over his head. And then at some point he or the the other man who had come out of the hole in the wall yelled at Ruthie to get down on the ground. Maybe she didn't comply, maybe she did, but after that, four gunshots rang out. All four shots hit Ruthie. However, these four shots did not kill Ruthie right away. And so Ruthie was very alive as these two men stole her TV, they stole her rocking chair and some other things. And Ruthie was almost certainly still alive when the police did finally show up and began knocking on her door and calling her phone. But she was bleeding to death. She couldn't move, she couldn't make a sound, but the police just abandoned her, at which point she did die. It would turn out that disturbing rumor that the police heard about this apartment building was that apparently people in this building had learned that you could pull off your mirror inside of your bathroom and literally climb into the walls. And from that point, you could basically wander all over this building and then punch other people's mirrors in their bathrooms in and then climb through that hole and do whatever you wanted to the people inside of that apartment. And so when Ruth Ruthie began hearing those whispers when she was in her bathroom looking at the mirror hoping for a miracle. 
Those were the sounds of thieves and killers and criminals slinking about her wall. Detectives speculated that the two men who killed Ruthie likely found out about her disability payments and decided to rob her. However, the two men that police arrested, the 19-year-old Edward Turner, who was found in possession of her TV, and this other man who was also arrested, were ultimately acquitted because there were so many people crawling through the walls all day and night inside of this building that there was no way to prove that those two were the ones who actually went in and killed Ruthie. To this day, no one else has ever been charged with Ruthie's murder. What happened to Ruthie became the basis for the very popular horror movie called The Candyman, starring Tony Todd. Wow. That's hard. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already. Wow. I ain't know nobody ever got arrested. I mean, ever got like charged. Yeah. I knew somebody. I didn't know two. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm going to say this. I possibly knew. But even though I probably possibly knew, I probably came across and just forgot like the minute detail. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But I knew majority of the details. Uh, I knew the, that they were gaining access through the bathroom there. Yeah, and that's how they were. And to be honest, was Ruth the only one? She probably was the only one. Well, let's be real. Is she possibly the only one that got killed? because of this stuff. But what was the reason for doing that? Uh, honestly, opportunity. What well, I'm talking about for for killing her. Either they... Cause nine because 9 times out of 10, they already knew who she was. Yeah, but 9 times out of 10, she probably would have complied with what you... Or because she identified him. Regardless of the fact, like you, well, like you just said, has anyone else... She's 52, right? Mm-hmm. They're 19. Mm -hmm. How long have they been living at this? She probably know them and their parents. You know what I'm saying? But if that's she not probably the first know, apartment she probably they like, went into. Honestly, she could have been like, Edward, what you doing in my, in my or whoever, who, whoever it was, what are you doing in my, and they, out of panic, shot her. That's so crazy. Or they knew she had already called the police and out of panic, shot her. Mm -hmm. Also, is it a possibility other people have been killed because y'all so used to people dying in the buildings, you probably ain't even fully investigating the situations. Okay, well, and then that goes back to if the second dude, like he's, like Ms. Bowen said, came back into the apartment, then the door would have been unlocked. But like I said, you got to realize we in project buildings. We in, we in uh, low-end apartment complexes. Those people, even if I hear a gunshot, I ain't sticking my head out. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if the second dude came back into the apartment and nine times out of ten, they left back out through the the wall. No, they probably came, they probably left out through the front door. Or the front door. It's I'm just pretty sure y'all didn't. Sh but I'm saying y'all didn't. Nine times out of ten, y'all didn't lock the door behind you. So when the police showed up, the door would have still been unlocked, and y'all could possibly just went in. I'm not. I'm gonna say this. Not well. Could it possibly have been locked? Because if they're if the if the project doors are anything like the doors that we had when I grew up, you can lock them like we can lock our door from oh, the, yeah, from yeah, the yeah. back, like from you the inside. The, you're you talking about the deadbolt. The deadbolt, like you actually had to lock the door. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know. Uh, that's yeah. You right. You right. But, but I'm, I'm just, I don't know. I'm just asking because I'm like, dang, if that's the case, then the door, y'all could, y'all would have been able to gain access to possibly help her. That's the only thing I'm well, thinking about. Well, let me say this. The door had to be locked because the maintenance man had to drill. Right, because he had to drill a hole through. So how, okay, unless he came back in, locked the door so nobody couldn't get in and they did what they did to her. Because I said this, you got to realize, right? The How hole. you fit a rocket chair and a TV through that little hole? You don't. You don't. I'm so confused. You don't. So nine times out of ten, y'all took the furniture out through the front door. We still can gain access through her through her spot. Came back in, locked. Y'all did all of that within fifteen minutes. Or honestly, all right. Let me say this: <laughs> they didn't steal the TV and stuff right away. 
you know something they right they didn't right, steal right, right away they did what they did they they knew she had called the police because the dude and, in the hallway and when they nine times out of ten they both probably heard her and they probably realized oh they not coming in they left they gone let's go back and do what we yeah you're right possibly yeah and then late at night yeah and she when just everybody there. sleep because it's a whole a whole day has well when did they finally well a whole day that. That night or that mm, day, the ne- and then the next stage. day, her friend got mm. the maintenance. Pe- that's that's so that's so sad. And then they come came back. No, they the police ended up coming back again. Then yeah, they came back again, but but the maintenance man they left was again, the, yeah. and the friend was furious, so she went and got the maintenance man, and he drilled the hose. Yeah, that's so sad. But, but yeah. they could they got the furniture out. Yeah, and that's the reason why it didn't look like a lot was moved out mm-hmm. because they wasn't able to get everything. Yeah, so. And think about it. Think about how the TVs were built back then with mm-hmm. them big ass booties the on, on mm-hmm. the back of it. You're not fitting that through them little holes yeah, in the wall saying, that you can right. fit, squeeze your little body through. You have to walk that out the front door. That's sad. And the right. reason, to be honest, the reason why nobody said anything about anybody stealing, because yeah. everybody was stealing from each other. Yeah. So everybody knew about these what was packages. Going on? Yeah. So they. They like, oh, they didn't hit her. Yeah. Ain't nobody thinking Ruth dead. And then, if y'all find out Ruth dead and y'all done seen them stealing at her right, spot, right. you're not going to say nothing. You're not going to say anything. Because y'all like, done killed her. Y'all will come back and kill me. What makes me, yeah. yeah. And nine times out of ten, to be honest, it's a gang-infested neighborhood. Nine yeah. times out of ten, y'all might be associated with gangs, That's... not putting that on you. Yeah. But... Also, if you get locked up, you might tell when you gang homies to come kill me because now I'm I'm the witness. Yeah. So true. with me being a witness, now it's, it's, again For I'm living here. It's just best to keep your mouth shut. I'm living here because I can't afford to go nowhere yeah. else. So it's called be quiet. Just protect yeah. your own. And but why did y'all build those apartments like that? Where you got to access point to be able, and to be able for them to have like a walk path through. To actually. In the, yeah, in the walk walls. Possibly, yeah, Literally in like, your, think about somebody walking through our walls and we have no idea, no clue. I just hear some whispering because they implied it to come through your. That's sad, bro. I, you know what I'm crazy, saying? That's crazy, yeah. And you and to be real, like you got to think about it. It's them project walls. Mm-hmm. You ain't thinking nobody in them walls. Cause mm-hmm. Them walls are thick. Brick. You ain't thinking somebody walking through them walls and everybody doing it. Mm-hmm. It just unfortunately she fell victim. She yeah, was just a victim sad. that night. Sadly, yeah. And my thing is, did they possibly breach her apartment because they didn't think she was in there? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. Because the way dude kicked, kicked the dough. I don't know, man. And then he probably got started by her and just took off running. But my thing is, why would you not expect somebody to be in their apartment? Because did we eight get a time? Night. It was eight eight something something night. Night. Why would yeah. you not expect someone to be in their apartment at that time of night? You Or you just knew who apartment. Possibly. Y'all know how to... You don't know what these... Criminals. <laughs> I, I like, wish I had got her last people. name. I forgot her last name. Mc, but McCor or Mc, 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 something like I'm, that. Because I want to, I wanted to understand like how big she was. Because he told me she, he said she was tall. She was a oh. taller lady. So I'm like, actually, how big, bigger of a lady she was? Because sometimes you see a woman six, <laughs> six foot. Yeah. Or over six foot. Hold on. Maybe I made up that last name, but well, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, I was right. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Ruthie, <laughs> Ruthie made McCoy. Do they have like an actual? Images or anything. That's what she looked like. Aww. Just like anybody else, grandma. Literally. That's sad. That's sad. But man, yo, 
Yeah, that's a sad situation. And then for them to take trauma like that and turn it into a blockbuster film. Yeah. And make so much money off of it. That's sad, bro. They do it all the time. And I think it was Cabrini Green. I'm not 100% sure, but I think it was the Cabrini Green Apartments. Mm -hmm. It was either those. Yeah, I want to say... I want to say it was... I don't know. I know, like... Chicago used to have like infamous apartment yeah. buildings like that. But hey man, y'all make sure y'all spend my stuff. Y'all let us know y'all thoughts and opinions Please in do. the comment section down below. Uh if y'all have any more details about it, uh you might have in Chicago no more details. Mm -hmm. Let us know in the comment section down below. But as always, I do go by the name DJ Nikki. This is Sierra Mo. No time to kick it, got a stack to flip for my foes. Dollar, 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 dollar. Please tell me you can hear me. Don't turn your back and don't declare me. Just let me know if you need me. Dollar, 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 dollar. Let me watch out for my partners. Keep my money long, get my team strong. Let me run away from my pride.